Hello and welcome to Skills and Automation. My name is Ash and today we will look at how to copy data from another Excel file. But the catch is that the data is not in a very structured format. There might be blank rows, columns may not be in the right sequence, etc. We will create a macro to cover all these scenarios. Normally, if you are grabbing data extracts from a database or an external party such as a supplier, we can reasonably expect the data to follow a standard format each time we receive it. But we can't rely on standard formats all the time. For example, imagine a file that's manually populated by a user or an employee. There is no telling if they have altered the format before sending the file through. Let us consider a timesheet which the contractor sends through back to us at the end of each month. Here, we have a list of 8 timesheets sent by 8 different contractors. Let's open the first file. This is an example of data being in the correct format. The data range starts from cell A1, there are no blank rows, no hidden columns, etc. We can just copy and paste this data directly into our destination file. And we can only wish that the rest of the contractors were as neat and tidy. Sadly, that is not the case. Let's look at the next file. Here we see our first variation. There are some blanks in the day column. This contractor has two lines for jobs done on the same day. But the date has been filled only in the first line. We will need to write a code to populate the same day as the previous row for each blank date field. Let's look at the next file. Here, the range doesn't start from cell A1. In fact, it starts from somewhere in the middle. This is going to be an interesting challenge since we have to find the data range in a worksheet. Next file. Here, there are blank rows in between the data set. We will need to delete this off. The next file, here columns B and C are hidden. We may need to unhide them if it affects our copy method. The next file, here columns C through to F are grouped. Again, we may need to ungroup them if it affects our copy method. The next file, all may seem okay out here, but in fact, the columns are not in the right sequence. This too will be an interesting challenge to overcome. And the last file, I'm gonna call this the boss file since it's the last paddy that we need to battle with. Previous files had one variation each. Here, there are multiple variations. There are blank columns, blank rows. The column headers are in the wrong sequence. In fact, there's an extra column which we don't need to import. And there are blank dates as well. Quite a bit to tackle. Now, let's go to the macro file. We have a console worksheet out here, which has the folder path where all the files are saved and the file name we want to import. There are two buttons out here. One links to a macro that grabs the data from the file selected in cell B4, which is this one here. And the other one grabs the data from all the files in the folder path specified in cell B3. We'll just run the second macro. So it's going to import data from all these eight files right here. And that's done. Let's go to our data sheet. All the data from the eight files has come into the right columns. There are no blanks. So it appears we have corrected the distortions. The main point to note here is that one macro is going to take care of everything, which is pretty amazing and also make it a bit complicated. So hang on tight. This is going to be an interesting video, but we need to note some points. There are probably a lot more ways the data can be distorted. We're just going to cover the common ways. And we shouldn't always try and use code to fix user errors. Sometimes we just need to draw a line in the sand and reject the file if the data is too distorted. For a macro approach, we will write the initial code to copy and paste the correct format. Then we will add each variation for each file as we go. And finally, we will add the loop. This will result in a code which is stable and will work, but it may not be the most optimized piece of code. However, I feel that this linear approach is the best way for me to explain the logic. If you have any suggestions though, please let me know in the comments. In the interest of time, we won't cover any error handling scenarios. All the code covered here is available on my blog site, and the macro file and the data files will be available on GitHub. Links will be in the description below. And starting from this video onwards, I'll be posting snippets of this video on YouTube that cover individual techniques. So watch out for those as well. 
So here we have our template macro file open. There is no code in here yet. It's just a blank shell. In cell B3, we'll include the folder path where the import files are saved. So copy, paste. And in cell B4, we'll write in the file name that we want to import. We'll start with the first file which has data in the right format. So this one right here, rename, copy and paste. Let's look at the other sheets. You'll notice that there are two more sheets, work and data. We will copy data from the import file as is and paste it into the worksheet work. We will perform all our format corrections out here. And once the data is aligned, we will transfer it to our worksheet data. The idea here is that we do not want to do any corrections in the original file. So we need a temporary location that is the worksheet work where we can do all the corrections before we proceed to the final destination. Okay, let's begin coding. Alt F11 to go to our VB editor. A quick note before we begin, we'll be referring to worksheets using the worksheets code name, which can be set by clicking on the worksheet, coming down to the properties window and typing in the code name out here. Now we will build the macro in three blocks. The first block will contain a sub designed to only import the data into the worksheet work. The second block will contain two subs designed to correct the data while it's still sitting in the worksheet work. And the third block will contain a sub that transfers data from the worksheet work to the worksheet data. I have designed this so that we can just focus on the parts we are working on, but you could optimize the code further by combining all of this together. Now let's create four modules, one for each block and one which will hold the main sub procedure and call the three separate subs from each block. We'll call this module main, call the next one import, call this one correct, and one more which we'll call transfers. Okay, let's start with block one. Open the import module, create a new sub. Let's clear any previous contents from the worksheet work. And we'll clear the contents in the worksheet data as well. But in this case, we will retain the headers, which are in columns A through to F. So we'll only delete data from row two onwards and within the columns A and F. The folder path and file name are in the console sheet in cells B3 and B4. We will combine these to create the full file path. Let's declare variables to hold the cell values and the final full file path string. And we'll grab the values from each cell. So first the folder path and the file name. And we'll join them together putting a backslash in between them as well. And we can open this file now, but since we want to interact with it, we will declare a workbook object variable and assign the open file to it. So declare a variable as a workbook object and let's set it to equal to the workbook that we're about to open. So to open a workbook, we will use the open method of the workbooks object and pass in this full file path as the parameter. And we'll declare a worksheet variable for sheet one as well. This is one of our assumptions that the data in the import file will be stored in the sheet called sheet one. We're gonna copy the data as is. If we expect the data to be always in the correct format, we could just copy the current region of the data range. But if the data is split by blank rows or blank columns, current region won't work for us. We will need to use used range instead, which is a property of the worksheet object. And choose the copy method. And the destination is, well, we're gonna place all the data first in the worksheet called work and in cell A1. And let's close the workbook. We don't wanna save the changes. Okay. That's it, let's test this out. C 
save our file first control s and let's run this macro that's done come to our worksheet work and we can see that the data has come in a fair bit of warning we're going to revisit this sub as we progress through this video and the end result is going to be a very fine beast but let's worry about that later moving on to the third block where we transfer data to the worksheet data. Hey, did we just skip block two? You're correct to notice that. And no, we didn't quite skip it. The first file that we're gonna import is in the correct format. We don't expect to do anything further to the data. So for now, we don't need block two. In this section, we will transfer the data from the worksheet work to the worksheet data. And we're not gonna copy over the headers. We're just interested in the body of the data. So we'll assign the current region to a range object variable, and then we'll resize the range to exclude the header. Let's come to the transfers module, create a new sub. First, let's declare a range object variable, then set it as the current region of the data in the worksheet work. Now, we want to exclude the headers. To do that, we will move down one row using offset, thus skipping over the header. We can just reuse the same range object variable. So we'll move down one row, and then we will resize the range to include one less row, but keeping the same number of columns. So the rows will be the count of rows in the range, minus one. And the columns will be the count of columns in the range. Now that we have the range, we could just copy and paste this range over the worksheet data into cell A2. Something like this. And the destination is cell A2 in the data worksheet. This would most definitely work. However, I just want to future proof the code a bit. In the final state, we'll be looping over all the files and pasting data from each file one below the other in the worksheet data. So we can't just directly paste data into cell A2 we need to find the first available row in the worksheet data and paste our data in there. So let's dim a variable to hold the next available row. To find the next available row, we'll count the number of rows in the current region and add one to it. And add one. And now we can paste the data into column A and into this next available row. So delete this part out, close the double quotes and paste in a variable. Great, save the file. Let's test this out, run the macro. So this is our worksheet work and let's go to our worksheet data and we can see that the data has copied over. Okay, now let's test this end to end. Now we need to run both the previous two macros in one single step. For that, we'll create one new sub and call each of those two subs one after the other. So we'll come here to our main module, create a new sub. Let's call the first sub, which is import data, and call the next one, which is transfer data. Great, that's it. Let's go to Excel, come to our console worksheet, come to our developer tab, insert and we'll add in a button track down create a rectangle choose the sub that we want to call which is this main sub called single import okay and right click edit text rename this to import single file let's save our file and run this so let's run our data has come into the worksheet work and it's transferred to the worksheet data as well. Great, now let's look at our first variation. In this scenario, we look at the file with the first variation in it. Here, we have some blank dates. The contractor seems to have omitted out the dates where there are two or more jobs on the same day. What we will do is loop through the day column and if we find a blank, we will assign the same date as the above cell. This will be a block two code where we correct the data that we have imported into the worksheet work. Open the module correct. 
create a new sub. We need to find the last row in order to loop over the data. Now, I just want to pause here a bit. There are many ways to find the last row. I have a video on it and I would encourage you to check it out. The point though is that the correct method would be dependent on how confident we are about our data set. In this very example, counting the rows in the current region would do just fine. But in future, we may expect there to be blank rows and the current region would fail in that case. The best way to find the last row in an unstructured data set is by using the range.find method. So let's dim a variable to hold the last row. I'm just going to paste in the code for the find method. It's a bit long winded, but we'll go through it step by step since we'll be using this a lot in our project. Okay, so what are we doing out here? We are searching for any value, which is indicated by the asterisk signs within all the cells in the worksheet work. We will start our search from range A1 and we'll go backwards, which is indicated by the search direction. So this will basically start our search from the bottom of the worksheet all the way through to the top till it finds the last used cell. And from that cell or range, we'll grab its row number. Again, if you're not familiar with this, please check out my video on this topic. Now, let's declare an iteration variable for the loop and a string variable to hold the date. This string data type for the date is on purpose as otherwise our code would error out if the contractor has filled in some value other than a date in that column. Let's create a loop. We'll skip the header and start the loop from the second row. Assign the value from the current row in column B to the S date variable. Now we can do one small bit of error handling here. If the column B in the first data row, which is this cell right here, has no value in it. So if this is blank, we can't just grab the date from the data row above because there is no date value there. In that case, we'll assign the cell a text value called unknown. So the value in the cell is blank. And if we are in the second row, then we'll assign that cell a text value called unknown. And if that happens, we want to skip over to the next row and not continue with the rest of the code in this loop. We'll use a line label to achieve this. So if this condition is met, we'll jump to this line label, which we will place right before we jump to the next iteration. Great. And if this condition is not met, it would mean that the first cell is not blank and we are now in the next row. In that case, if the estate variable is still blank, then we'll assign the value in the above cell to it. So the value in the current cell will be the value of the cell directly above it, which would be in the same column, but the row would be minus one, which is the row above it. And that's it for this sub. Let's add this to our main sub procedure. So copy the sub name, come to the main sub procedure, and let's call the sub. And now let's change the file name to the first variation file, which is this one right here, control V, save this file and let's import it. We can see that everything has copied over and there are no blanks in the date column. Awesome. Moving on to the next scenario where the data range could be anywhere in the worksheet. Let's look at our next variation file. This data range is well away from the boundaries of the worksheet. That is, it does not begin in the first row nor does it begin in the first column. So without actually looking at the worksheet physically, it would be very difficult for us to tell where this data range exactly is. Okay, so how do we proceed out here? Well, we can use the range.find method to find the first used row, the first used column, the last used row, and the last used column. This would effectively give us the boundary of the range, which is what we need to define it and copy it. We will need to make changes to our block one code where we import the data from the source file. So we'll need to delete this line off and replace it with the range.find method. Let's head on over to my blog site and we'll type in last row and we'll go to this article on how to find the last row using the find method and scroll below. So this right here is the code to find a use range in a worksheet, no matter where it is. Let's copy all of this. And no, we are not cheating out here. 
This is exactly how we build code in real life. If you don't know how to do something, then search for it online, go to the website, and if you trust the code, copy it and paste it into your VB editor. So let's paste it right here. So let's see what's happening in this code. This first line is looking for the last used row. We can tell by looking at the after parameter, the search order, and the search direction. We're gonna start our search from the first cell and look backwards. This will take us to the bottom of the data set and we're searching by rows. So we're gonna find the cell in the last row and from that we can get the row number. And the next line is looking for the last used column. It does the same thing as above, just here, the search order is by columns. And the next line is looking for the first used row. And here's a twist. We'll start the search from the very last cell in the worksheet. And then we will look in the next cell, which is the opposite of what we did above. So to go to the last cell in Excel, do control right and then control down. So this is the last cell in Excel and a search direction is next, which will effectively take us right to the top of the worksheet and we'll start looking in cell A1 onwards. And since the search direction is by rows, we know we're looking for the first use row. The next line uses the same logic. Just here, we're looking for columns, which will give us the first use column. And finally, we come to the select method. With the four results from up here, we can determine our range. To determine our range dynamically, we need the first cell and the very last cell in the data range. The first cell can be referred to using the first row and the first column, while the last cell can be referred to using the last row and the last column. Okay, so we need to tweak this code slightly to suit our needs, nothing much. We'll just update these worksheet references. So wherever we see WSINV, we'll replace it with the worksheet we're trying to copy the data range from, which is the worksheet of the file we've just opened, which is WS. So the shortcut for doing this is just select this entire data range, go control F. So you want to find WSINV, go replace. We're going to replace it with WS and hit replace all. Okay. And all instances of WSINV have now become WS. Now come down to the select method, delete this off. So we'll choose the copy method. And the destination is range A1 in the worksheet work. And that's it. Let's save this file and we'll run the macro on the version two file. So let's click the button, come to our data worksheet. And this is our data out here. Everything's pasted fine. All the blank columns and the blank rows at the start have disappeared. Awesome. Moving on to the next scenario. Let's look at the next variation. Here we have blank rows in between a data set. We need to delete them. Just note here, we want to delete the row only if there is no data in the entire row. If the row has one or a few blank cells, we would still like to retain it. Okay. This code will go into our block two where we correct our data. So come to our correct module, create a new sub, give it a name. We will call this sub right after we import the data. So the scenario for this sub is that data has already been imported into the worksheet work. Let's find the last row in that worksheet. So we'll dim a variable for it. And we'll use the range.find method to find the last row. Now we'll create a loop to iterate through the data set and delete off the blank rows. But the point to note here is that we need to iterate backwards. That is from the last row to the top. Why backwards? Well, the best answer to that is to create a normal loop starting from the first row and moving down to the last row. And then we'll see what happens out there. So dim an iteration variable, create the loop. And how can we tell if the row is blank? Well, we can use the Excel count a function, which counts the non-blank cells. And if there are only blank cells in a row, then the function will return a zero. Let's write an if statement to check for that. And we are after the count a function. And what are we counting? We're counting for all the non-blank cells in the current row in the worksheet work. And if there are no non-blank cells, that is, if this function returns a zero, then, well then, we'll just delete off this row. Let's save this. Okay, let's run this loop in split screen mode. We'll put a breakpoint 
on the delete method and run this macro. So it stopped here, hover over I. This tells us we are in row I3. Let's F8 to see what happens. And the blank row is deleted. Well, that's exactly what we want. Or is it? Let's go on and continue this loop. Hit F8 and one more F8. What? We just skipped over this condition. But isn't the next row blank as well? Well, correct, but not exactly correct. The loop is now in row number four. So you can see that by hovering over I and row number four is not blank. The next blank row has now shifted up to row number three. So what just happened here? When you delete a row, Excel shifts the below data set up. So the next blank row, which was in row four, has now become row three. So this is the issue with looping from top to down and trying to delete rows. If there are two consecutive blank rows, then the second row will get skipped over. We won't face this issue when we loop backwards. And I won't dissect the code by stepping through it. If you have any doubts, I will encourage you to step through the code in a backward loop and see what exactly happens to the data when you delete a row. So stop this, remove the breakpoint. Okay, now we'll go backwards. So starting from the last row and moving up to row one. And how do we tell the loop to go backwards? We need to say step and minus one. Let's run this now. Come to Excel file. All the blank rows have been deleted. And since we're already in this sub, let's create some code to delete blank columns. Even if it's not a requirement for this variation, it's good to have that code as well. I'm just gonna go ahead and paste in the code out here. This is the exact same thing that we did up here. The only difference is that this time we're looking for columns and we're deleting off the blank columns. Okay, let's add this sub to our main macro. Control C and we'll call it right after we import the data. Save the file, come to our console worksheet, change the file name and let's import. Create the data is pasted over, there are no blank rows, awesome. Let's move on to the next scenarios. This is our next file. We have some columns out here which are hidden. So do we need to unhide these before we copy them? Let's test it out. Come to our macro, change the file name to variation four and let's import that file that we just saw. Come to the data worksheet and everything seems to have pasted fine, including the hidden columns. So I'm sorry, this was a bit of a misdirection. We don't need to do anything out here. Let's look at the next file. Some columns out here have been grouped and you may be skeptical here whether we need to do anything here as well. The answer to that is let's test it and see. Come to our macro, change this to variation five and we'll import the file. That's done, come to our data worksheet and everything seems to have pasted here fine. So both these scenarios were misdirections. And just to be clear, we don't need to unhide or ungroup rows or columns in order to copy them. But I think there is value in knowing that you don't have to worry about these scenarios when importing data. Okay, moving on to the next scenario. And let's look at the next file. On first glance, everything does look fine out here, but actually the columns are not in sequence. This R's column should actually be in the last position. Let's see how to code for this complexity. For this, we're gonna to have to rewrite our entire transfer data macro. This macro is designed to pick up the data range as is from the worksheet work into the worksheet data. It relies on the data being in the right sequence, but that's not a reliable assumption for us. And we'll just need to create some new logic. I'm gonna comment out the original sub so that you can access this old code as well from GitHub. Let's create a new sub with the same name. Let's think through what we're gonna do out here. We're gonna loop through each column header in the data worksheet. And for every column header, we will search for the same column header in the worksheet work. And say once a match is found, we'll copy just the contents in that column over. So to be clear, instead of copying the entire range, now, we'll be copying data column by data column. Let's declare some variables to hold the column and row numbers in the data worksheet. L column data will be the last column on the right in the worksheet data. So the last column is basically just the count of all the columns in the current region. 
we will need this variable to iterate across the column headers. And the last row data will hold the next available row in the worksheet data for us to paste the data into. We'll declare some more variables to hold the column and row numbers in the worksheet work. L row work will hold the last row of used data in the worksheet work. And L call work will we'll assign this on the go within the loop. This will hold each column header name from the worksheet data as we iterate across the header row. This is an iteration variable. And let's declare a range object variable for the range that we're going to search in. We are going to iterate across the headers in the worksheet data, but we'll search for each header name in the worksheet work and specifically in the first column. So let's set this variable to equal to the first row in the current region of the worksheet work. So this first row is basically the header row of the worksheet work. And let's create a loop. First, we'll grab the column header from the worksheet work and we'll search for the value of this variable in the header range of the worksheet work. And once we find a matching cell, we'll grab the column number of that cell. So the column number will be given by this variable. So we're searching for the column header name in the header range of the worksheet work. And once we grab the column number, we can pretty much define the column range that we want to copy over. So we'll feed in the starting cell and the last used cell within this column. We start from the second row and which column? Well, it's this column number right here. And what's the last cell in that column range? It is this last row out here and the last column. And what are we going to do with this? Well, we're going to copy it. And we're going to paste it in the data worksheet. And where exactly? In the next available row, which is this one right here. And in the matching column, which is nothing but I. And that's it for this sub. But we're not done yet. This correct data sub relies on the data values being in column B. But this won't work if our columns are not in sequence. So we need to change this sub as well. We will retain most of this coding. Just after we find the last row, let's find the column number with the column header name day. It's pretty much the same logic as before. So this is the column number variable. This is the header range in the worksheet work. And we'll search for the word day in the header range. And for the matching cell, we'll return back the column, which we'll populate into the call date variable. And now that we have this column number, we can replace all these hard codings with this column number. All of these will become cells. Current row is I, column number is column date. And let's change the rest of it as well. And that's it for this sub. Let's go to Excel, change the file name to variation six. And let's run the macro. Awesome. Let's come to the data worksheet. Everything now has pasted into the right columns. So everything works well. Let's move on to the final boss version. This is the last file. Till now, we've dealt with one variation at a time. This final file contains a bit of every variation. Blank columns, blank rows. The columns are not in sequence. The dates have blanks in them. And there is even an extra column which we should not be copying over. But we're not going to write any code for this. We will just run the macro that we've built so far over this file as a final test of our code. So let's change this variation file name to seven, run the macro. Beautiful. Everything has copied over correctly. Now let's build some code to loop across all the files and copy all the data one below the other into the worksheet data. For this, we need to change the import macro and the main macro. Open the main module. We'll create a new sub. Next, go to the import sub. Instead of modifying this, I'm just gonna copy and paste it above again, effectively making a duplicate sub procedure. And I'll change this name to two. So this sub procedure will work with our single import macro. And this sub procedure will work with a multi import macro, which you're about to build. 
So coming back to our import data macro, we need to cut this entire code out, come to our main macro and paste it in here. Why are we doing this? Because the import macro was based on importing individual files. Now we want to loop over all the files. So we need to trigger this logic from the main sub, grab each file name and supply it to the import data sub. That being said, we don't need these two lines anymore. And we'll use the dir function to loop over the files. The dir function takes in the folder path and gives back the first file name that it found. Let's assign our file name variable to the first file that's captured by this dir function. Let's feed in our folder path. And we want to specifically loop over just .xlx files. We can do that by concatenating the extension using this asterisk character, which denotes any file with the extension .xlsx. Now let's begin the loop. I'm going to make a separate detailed video on this, but in a nutshell, we'll create a do while loop that will run as long as we can find the next Excel file. Once the last file has been looped over, this do while loop will need to stop. So this indicates that as long as the s file name variable does not return a blank value, we will keep running this loop. Let's create the full file path. We don't actually need to do this because the current directory is now our folder with the files. But this makes intuitive sense, so I prefer to code it like this. And let's call our individual subs. So all these here. And remember we're calling import data too. But now we need to supply the full file path to the import data sub. Let's add this in now and go to the import sub and add this full file path as a parameter. So go to the import macro and supply a parameter as a string. Okay, the loop is almost done. Let's come back to our main sub. We need to tell the loop to go to the next file after all of this has been completed. And we can do that just by calling the dir function again. Okay, that's done. Now let's go back to our Excel file, create a button. We're gonna assign the multi import macro. Rename this. And let's run this. For this macro, the individual file in cell B4 does not actually matter. All we're doing now is looking at the cell B3 for the folder path. So click on it. We got an error, click OK. Forgot an equal to sign, equal to. Stop this. Let's try again. Okay, something's happening. And that's run, come to our data worksheet. All the files have been imported and all the data seems to be in the right place. Great, and that's all our code. Let's wrap this video up with one note on error handling using find methods. One word of caution. We haven't looked at any error handling code, mostly to save time. But there's one thing I would like to point out too, just so that you're aware. The range find method works amazing if there is a match to be found. But if there is no match found, it will throw an error and you may need to plan for that. What you could do is add a resume next statement prior to the range find code. This would skip the next line of code if an error is found. And then you could reset the error handler with a go to zero statement after the range.find line. This will not affect the code, but could prevent the macro from going bust. And that's the video. We've covered a lot of interesting ground here. At least I hope you found it interesting. This is one of the reasons why I love VBA. What we did here today would take someone so much time to manually correct, going through each file and rearranging the data. But I'll be honest, I quite enjoy such challenges and the results are pure magic. And that's it for now. If you found some value here in this video, please like and subscribe. Thanks and see you in the next one.